I'm Kieran McCreesh. This is joint work with Stefan Gott and Jakob Nordstrom at Copenhagen and Lund, and Ross McBride, Patrick Prosser, and James Trimble, who are with me at Glasgow. And this is a paper about implementing graph algorithms that don't contain bugs. So what's our motivation? There are a lot of dedicated tools for clique problems. Maximum clique is an important problem in its own right, and it also shows up as a component in solving other hard problems. Unfortunately, several of these solvers are buggy, including the solver that's often regarded as state of the art. But even buggy clique solvers nearly always produce the right answer. This paper is about fixing this. We show how we can use proof logging to make certifying solvers, not just for maximum clique, but also maximum weight clique and clique enumeration, and then for maximum common subgraph and maximum common connected subgraph problems, both using dedicated solvers and through a reformulation to clique. So what's a certifying solver? A traditional solver produces uh, an output, which is an answer. A certifying solver additionally produces a certificate alongside an answer, which gives us a way of guaranteeing that an output is correct. A certificate is something that can be checked by a simple independently developed tool that will tell us whether or not we have found a correct solution. This does not guarantee that a solver is correct, but it does guarantee that if a solver ever produces an incorrect answer, then we can detect it even if this is due to hardware or compiler errors. In the SAT community, proof logging is fairly standard using uh, RUP and DRAT, LRAT and GRIT and so on. But it is not used if SAT solvers do cardinality reasoning. We do a lot of cardinality re type reasoning here, so we'll be using pseudo-Boolean formulae instead, and proofs using reverse unit propagation and cutting planes derivations. Let's take a quick look at this in practice. We run our favorite clique solver on our favorite benchmark instance. It takes 100,000 search nodes and 175 milliseconds to find and prove optimality. We can run the solver again and tell it to produce a proof log, which it does. It takes longer because it is producing a 500 megabyte proof log as part of its output. And then we can pass this proof log through the verifier, which tells us that yes, we have successfully proved optimality. What do we observe? The techniques we describe in the paper are general and not limited to one specific graph solver or algorithm. The implementation effort is very small and can even speed up development by finding bugs much more quickly. And with the right proof format, it is quick and convenient to express combinatorial arguments. Proofs are in some ways efficient, they are of the same length as the amount of work done by the solver. And we can even log reformulations, which is important for constraint programming. And our bold conclusion, which is in no way controversial, is that it's time for competition organizers to start requiring proof logging support from all entrants. And now for some more details. So in the maximum clique problem, we're given a graph. And we have to find a subset of vertices where every vertex in a subset is adjacent to every other vertex in a subset. And we want this subset to be as large as possible. So I can show you a full clique in this graph and what we're interested in is how I would go about convincing you that there is nothing bigger. So let's take a look at the certifying process. The first thing we need to do is decide how we're going to express the problem. And we're going to do this in pseudo-Boolean form. A pseudo-Boolean formula is a zero one integer linear program. It is conveniently a superset of CNF. We have a set of zero one valued variables, xi, and we define uh, not xi to be 1 minus xi. We have integer linear inequalities as constraints, so the weighted linear sum over some variables is greater than or equal to some constant. And if we're dealing with an, an optimization problem, then we have an objective, which is to minimize the uh, weighted linear sum of uh, some of the variables. We need to write this out in the OPB format, which is the standard file format for pseudo-Boolean solving. And then we need to provide a proof log for this OPB file. If we're looking at an unsat decision instance, we need to prove that we can derive zero is greater than or equal to one from these constraints. We can also do proof logging for satisfiable decision instances for enumeration problems where we have to show we found every solution and for optimization problems. And then we take the OPB file and the proof log and we feed them to VeryPB, which is our proof verifier, which will tell us whether or not we've produced a valid proof that 
that uh, does what we claim it does. So how do we encode a cleat problem into the Boolean form? This is very straightforward. We have a variable for each vertex. Uh, the variable takes the value one if that vertex is included in the clique and zero otherwise. And then we have an objective, which is we want to set as many variables to be true as possible. We'd like to say that we have to maximize the sum of the variables, but OPB only supports minimization. So we want to maximize the negation of the variables instead. Uh, we can see in the uh, second line of the proof, the OPB file at the bottom of the screen. We want to minimize, and the way you read this is minus one times x1 plus minus one times x2 plus minus one times x3 and so on. We then have our constraints. So for every non-edge in the graph, uh, here we're saying one not x3 plus one not x1 is greater than or equal to one. So because vertices one and three are not adjacent, we can't take them both. So we're saying here that at least one has to be false. And we do this for every single non-edge. Then we had run a solver, which would produce a search tree that looks something like this. I'll not go into details, just to say that we find uh, at the top right an early incumbent with three vertices, vertices 7, 9, and 12. And then later on, we find an incumbent, a stronger incumbent with four vertices, 1, 2, 5, and 8. And eventually, we determine there's nothing bigger. So let's look at a proof that describes this search tree. A proof for the VeriPV verifier begins with a header, which I'll not describe in detail. We have these lines that start with O that correspond to the two incumbents we found. Uh, an O line is an objective line. It says, okay, check that the uh, check that the thing I'm telling you here is a valid solution to the problem. It is a feasible solution. And then create a new constraint saying that anything we find after this has to be bigger, uh, has to give a better objective function value. Then we have a series of U-lines. We have one of these U-lines for every single backtrack that is carried out, by, carried out in our search tree. Uh, the way we read this backtrack is, uh, okay, uh, not x12 plus not x7 is greater than or equal to one. So we're saying, I'm asserting that either x7 is false or x12 is false. Then subsequently I'm saying, okay, now I'm asserting that x12 is false then, okay, I'm asserting that x11 and x10 are false, so I'm deeper in the search tree again. I backtrack a bit further and observe that x11 is false. Then I say, okay, x8 and x5 is false. I say just x8 is false. Then finally, I'm back at the root of the search tree and I backtrack the last time and I'm saying here that uh, the empty sum is greater than or equal to one, so zero is greater than or equal to one. And I finish by asserting contradiction. So what do these U-lines mean? These are reverse unit propagation statements. So in order to tell you what reverse unit propagation is, I have to tell you what unit propagation is. Uh, unit propagation on a pseudo-Boolean model is integer bounds consistency. If you're familiar with unit propagation in SAT, it's the same thing if all your constraints are clauses. But in general, if you have uh, non-causal constraints, then unit propagation is stronger in a pseudo-Boolean setting than it is for SAT solvers. So what about reverse unit propagation? So we have a set of constraints big C that we know so far. These could be from the model or constraints we've already learned. And we have a new constraint, little c, that we want to introduce. What we do is we check that all the constraints we have so far, combined with a negation of little c, our new constraint, leads to contradiction. Not doing any such, just using unit propagation. And if this is the case, then it is obvious that we can add little c as a new constraint. If adding uh, not little c immediately leads to a contradiction, then we can add c instead. And it turns out that this is really convenient for silver authors being able to express reverse unit propagation steps because we don't have to explicitly justify adjacency reasoning. What we can say is, okay, I've branched on vertices one, three, and seven. Uh, and the proof verifier will then go and work out, okay, all the remaining vertices have to be false then just due to adjacency. We don't have to tell it how to do this. Uh, 
this this really simplifies things uh, in terms of bookkeeping for solver authors. But what about bound functions? So let's suppose I can color a subgraph using k colors. So each each vertex gets a color. I use k different colors, and any uh, any two vertices in the same color class cannot be adjacent. Uh, in effect, each color class here is describing an, at most one constraint. So if I can use k colors for a subgraph, then I cannot have a clique of more than k vertices in that subgraph. Now, unfortunately, these at most one constraints do not follow from reverse unit propagation. So if I took that proof that I just showed you and fed it, it and fed it into VeriPV, it would say, no, no, you've not given me a valid proof. Uh, I cannot assert these constraints by reverse unit propagation. So we need to use a cutting planes proof system to help out. Uh, you can think of cutting planes for as being to pseudo Boolean solving what resolution is to SAT solving. In the cutting planes proof system, we can take two constraints and we can add them together to make a new constraint. We can multiply a constraint by any non-negative integer. We can divide a constraint by a positive integer with rounding up. And using just these steps, we can manually derive at most one constraints for color classes, and it's very easy to do this. It's worth pointing out that reverse unit propagation can be written as a series of cutting point steps as well, but it is more work for solver authors to do this. Uh, it involves a lot more bookkeeping and keeping track of things. Uh, reverse unit propagation is a convenience rather than a core feature of a proof system. So what does this look like? I'll not go into detail, but the... Uh, manually derive constraints of the lines that start with P that I've added in. Uh, we can see the first P line here says, um, take the non-adjacent 1, 3 constraint and multiply it by 2. This is reverse Polish notation. Add the non-adjacent 1, 9 constraint. Add the non-adjacent 3, 9 constraint and divide the whole thing by 3 to create a new constraint. And this now is a complete proof that will be accepted by VeriPB. So we implemented this in the Glasgow subgraph solver, which has a dedicated clique solver. It's not the fastest clique solver in the world. It might be the fastest correct clique solver in the world. It's a bit parallel solver. It can perform a coloring and a recursive call in under a microsecond. So bear that in mind when you see the overheads that proof logging introduces. We can solve 59 of the 80 DIMX benchmark instances in under a thousand seconds if we don't have proof logging. We managed to produce and verify proof for 57 of these 59 instances. The other two reached a terabyte of disk space, and we had to kill them. The mean slowdown from proof logging was a factor of 80. This is almost entirely due to disk I.O. Remember, we're doing uh, a recursive call in under a microsecond. Each recursive call requires maybe a kilobyte of uh, proof logging, and I was working with spinning rust disks here, which are not the fastest. And uh, verification was a uh, further factor of 10 slower on top of that. And just to give you an idea of implementation effort, uh, if you have one good master's student who has never implemented a clique algorithm before and has never implemented proof logging before, then they should be able to produce you a proof logging maximum clique implementation as a master's dissertation. But that's just one maximum clique algorithm. There are a lot more using different search orders, different bound functions, different underlying data structures, uh, techniques like priming using local search to find a strong incumbent. But what we show in the paper is that uh, none of these techniques really affect proof logging very much. So once you've implemented proof logging for one maximum clique solver, the rest really require very little effort. We also look at the maximal clique enumeration problems. So find me all the cliques that cannot be made bigger by adding at least one vertex. And there are contradictory results for maximal clique enumeration in the literature. People disagree upon what the answer for various instances is. For proof logging, we need a way of expressing maximality in pseudo Boolean form. This is easy. We just say either you take a vertex V or you have to take at least one of V's neighbors. We proof log every backtrack and every time we find a solution. And there is no need to proof log anything for maximality. These algorithms use something called a not set, which is a very clever data structure for uh, checking maximality. 
it turns out that reverse unit propagation is strong enough to figure out what the knot set is doing without us having to help. And we make a strong case in the paper that this will work for all maximal clique algorithms that, e that have ever been invented. In terms of implementation effort, this takes roughly one day for somebody who has never implemented any kind of proof logging before. In comparison, implementing one of these algorithms without proof logging takes several days. And we verified results on some standard benchmark graphs of up to 10,000 vertices. We also looked at weighted clique algorithms where vertices have weights and we're trying to find the heaviest clique. Uh, modern maximum weight clique solvers use weighted color classes. It turns out that for proof logging, this is just one multiplication step to be added in. And vertices can split their weights between color classes in some recent solvers. Again, that's fine. There are no changes needed to proof logging. It all just works. In terms of implementation effort, you can add in proof logging in an afternoon if you've already seen how it's done for unweighted cliques. And finally, we look at maximum common subgraph problems. So you're given two graphs and you want to find the biggest graph that's common to both of them. This is finding an injective partial mapping from the first graph to the second. And we're also interested in the connected version of a problem where the graph you find has to be connected. The state of the art here is a CP style forward checker called McSplit, but it uses different underlying data structures that exploit the special structure of the domains to run much faster. It uses all different except null as a bound function, and it can do this in linear time due to this special structure. And it handles the connected constraints for a combination of branching rules and propagation. It turns out that connected is slightly awkward to encode in pseudo Boolean form. It does require dependent auxiliary variables, but once we've done this, uh, reverse unit propagation can handle everything that the propagator and restricted branching does without any additional help, so we don't need to worry about it any further. Another popular approach to solving the problem is through reduction to clique. This is better on labeled graphs. It turns out that we can encode this reduction using cutting plane rules. So uh, given a PB file for the constraint programming model, we can just turn this into a PB file for uh, solving a clique uh, so that the verifier can check this. We can then give this to a clique solver and it can output a proof not realizing that it is working on a maximum common subgraph problem rather than a clique problem. And this works even when connectivity is involved. So a reformulation is handled within the proof logging system. In terms of results, uh, in both cases it took around a day to implement proof logging. The underlying solvers are much more difficult to implement than that. Uh, the slowdowns are uh, fairly substantial. We see from split slowdowns of 67 to 300 for non-connected and connected. But then McSplit does make 5 million recursive calls per second, so this is perhaps not surprising. And verification is a further order of magnitude slower. And it's worth saying that when I was re-implementing the clique variant of this problem, uh, I made a stupid mistake in how I was doing connectivity. Uh, proof logging found this straight away. Testing would not have found it uh, without an awful lot of effort. So I think I can say that uh, it was actually less effort to implement this algorithm with proof logging than it would have been without, because uh, I would have spent a lot more time trying to find that bug otherwise. So concluding thoughts. Proof logging is very cheap to implement uh, compared to implementing a solver. It can even potentially speed up development. And if we write proof logging format, proofs are very easy to write, but still simple. We do not need a proof log to be aware of every single bound function or propagator. And we can still have proofs that are in some sense efficient. So there are no exponential blowups here. All the proofs we generate are in some sense uh, proportional to the amount of work done by the solver. We think it's time for proof logging to become a new standard. For a lot of buggy solvers, there's a culture of my solver is faster on these benchmark instances, so you should publish my paper. This is particularly annoying when solvers are reused in other areas and people have to deal with these buggy solvers. Proof logging is too slow to require it to be on all the time. Oh, as strange as it sounds, graph solvers are much faster and much stronger at propagating than SAT solvers, so uh, this is not like SAT where proof logging is cheap. But it is usable in practice for medium sized instances, and it does allow reformulation to be handled by the proof logger, which we think is important going forwards. Thank you.